Great. Uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we welcome you in this place. Uh, Lord, we are here to honor you. We are here to worship you. We are here to adore you. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that even as we learn from your word, uh, we would... Lord, we, I pray that our spirits would be renewed, Lord. Come and have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Great. Uh, welcome once again. Good morning. Good morning to all of you who are joining us online. Um, so we'll uh, start off from chapter 7 um, in praise and worship. So I, I want to kind of mix chapter 7 and chapter 8 as one big chapter. Okay, so we look at chapter 7 and chapter 8 as one uh, big chapter. Uh, who's missing? Someone's uh, missing. Sean. Okay. Is everything okay with them? Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll start talking about, uh, it's also one of my favorite uh, topics or uh, yeah, topics to study about is the presence of God. Presence of God. Okay. Uh, presence in Hindi is what? Present? What? Presence. That's what it is. Okay. So when you say, well, what is presence of God? What is it in Hindi? Okay. Upastiti. Correct, no? I'll cross check with them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Presence of uh, God. Uh, in other language? Sorry? Okay. So, uh, Upasthiti, yeah? Nina is also helping me out. You're right, Vimal. <laughs> uh, what, what else? What else? Okay. It's the same thing as. No. The what? You're saying what he said? No. Is it... All right, let's move on. <laughs> okay. Uh, great, guys. So, uh, so when you, uh, so the question for us is, uh, what does the presence of God I mean to you? Even for those online, please um, put your answers in the chat section. So presence of God, when you think of it, when you think of those words, presence of God, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Guys, I know you all didn't have your breakfast, okay, but you just come on, okay. <laughs> you were right in front of me and I still can't hear you, okay. <laughs> what, do you what did you say? What? Throne room, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Throne room, okay, that comes to him. Why throne room? Because that is where he is. Okay. All right. What else? When you think of presence of God, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Holy Spirit realm. Okay. Ooh, all right. Okay. Sean says, um, I'm in classes today because I'm sick. Uh, yeah, sure, Sean. <laughs> oh, wait, you take care. Uh, there is a promised presence which we know by faith and other is the manifest presence. Okay, yeah, thank you, Nina. What else? Presence of God. We all use that in our worship or in, in, in our day-to-day -day Christian language. Like presence of God, presence of God, presence of God. Even when we pray, we say, Lord, we welcome your presence over here. Um, so what does it mean? Presence of God. Jesus. Yeah, he is coming and being with us. Yes. What else? Yes. Upastiti. Parmeshwar ka upastiti. No, so what does it mean to you? What do you what does it come to your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? 
it's not just for him, for you also. Let's say, here yeah, you were saying. Free, okay, all right. Oh, feel, okay, okay. Francis? Taleatatra. The what? Ministry. Holy Spirit ministry. Okay, okay. All right, ministry. Peace of God. Okay. All right, Surya says, uh, He is alive. That is the presence of God. He is living God. Yeah. Vimal? God is present. Okay. So what does that mean? His presence. What does it mean? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Okay. So let's just look at that word, presence. Okay, presence. Everybody say presence. So uh, what is the meaning of that word, presence? What does it mean? Like, huh? Being present. Yeah. And so, what does one a person's presence do to you, to an to an atmosphere or to an environment? What does it do? That brings joy, okay? Sorry. Enables us to sing, okay? Friends, all right. We are conscious that He is with us. It's the assurance that we have. Yeah. We are conscious. We are conscious that He is with us. Okay. So let's just look at presence itself. Okay. So let's imagine this is a nice cafe or whatever. Okay. All of you are having tea because you didn't have tea uh, <laughs> but um, so you're studying you're doing whatever you want to do uh, but then um, let's say uh, let's say Pastor Ashish is here okay so and he's not having a direct conversation with you right he is not looking in, into your eyes he's not looking at your face and talking but he is just sitting on the table over there and he's having his coffee or whatnot yes so we are not going to act wild and crazy, isn't it? We are not going to shout. We are not going to do whatever we want to do. Yeah. Why? Because although, you know, he's doing his own thing over there, we all know that he is over there. Yes or no? So that means we are conscious of his presence, right? Presence actually comes from the word. Present is one thing, but present also from the person, right? So it's the presence of a person, persona, they say, no? Persona, so that's what presence is all about. So why, here's a question once again for all of us. Why is the presence of God important? Simple question. Why is the presence of God important? We are worshipping and praying for the presence of God. Yeah, all the fine. Why? That is my question. So why is it important? Because that will change us. Okay. So why is it important? Why is Parmeshwar uh, Why is it important? Because I'm not, yeah. How do you say in, in, important in Hindi? Q? Mahatwa? Poon? Hey. So Parmeshwar ka Upastiti. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to learn Hindi also. So. Q Zaruri hai. Q Zaruri hai. Bol. Up bol. In English, bro. So <laughs> I won't understand. <laughs> we can't live without his presence, okay? We can't live without his presence. What else? Why is it important? Pass, pass. Okay, some answers. Surya says to believe that he is there. Okay. 
uh, his presence is a tangible environment krisha says yeah that's what we that's what we count on we live and move and have a being in him so nina so uh, why is it uh, yeah well, the question remains why 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 is it important is it just to so we can live move and have a being in him or is there anything that more you want to add to it to experience him okay that's why he we, he created us to long for to live in his presence okay, remember that okay we love him okay see the reason i'm just asking questions and digging a little deep is because sometimes as christians we use these words presence of god so much in our lives we forget the significance of it the weight of it you know what i'm saying it's the oh, presence of god presence of god you know we pray we start the prayer with that we end sometimes we end with that uh, we only say okay you lead us let your presence come with us and what not right it's like we we are we gotten used to that language and we it's it's possible that we might uh, oversee the significance of it the importance of it that is why i'm asking you the question it's a simple question and i'm making you think that's it okay so the question still remains <laughs> why is it important presence of god gives us comfort uh, at times of trouble sean says yeah Without the presence of God, we can't overcome the world. Yeah. There are, okay, so let's move on. Right. There are uh, very few people, uh, you know, in the Bible like who recognize the presence, the importance of his presence, right? Uh, one of them is Moses, who says, like, if your presence doesn't come with us, we will not go. We all know that verse. Yeah. If your presence doesn't come with us, we will not go from here. Um, but let's just go. Um, Let's go to the first book of the Bible. Let's read Genesis chapter 3. Okay. Genesis chapter 3. I'll read it for us. Uh, Genesis 3 verse 8 okay so until this point what all has happened creation has happened God has created man and women uh, you know in his own image all of that has happened um, Eve has Eve Adam and Eve have uh, eaten out of the fruit they've disobeyed God yeah so here's the thing Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 then the man and his wife heard the sound of of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden okay um, so we kind of start something called the tabernacle of Moses we heard of that tabernacle of Moses it kind of starts from there Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. They hid from the Lord, right? So what happened when they sinned? Or what was what were they enjoying before the sin, before the fall? What were they enjoying? The presence. Like most of you said, they're living, they're being. It was natural. It was not supernatural, right? His presence was natural for them they would walk in the cool of the garden they were enjoying his presence they were feeding off his presence as soon as they sinned disobeyed what happens what sin basically does is it separates us everybody says separate what does separation mean it's like you separate one thing from another isn't it that's what sin did it separated us from the presence of god Okay, like uh, a dislocated shoulder, uh, head, 
I can't think of any other example because I have had a dislocated shoulder. So anybody had a shoulder dislocated? So this shoulder is in the socket like this, isn't it? So uh, I had an injury. And uh, you see this curve over here that we have? Right? It was flat. <laughs> because um, So it, it had come off uh, the joint, that socket. So it was flat. So that's what kind of sin does. It separated us from God, from his presence. They hid from him. They hid. God didn't hide. God came after them. Right. And then what's the next? What's the first thing God asks? What's the first thing? Where are you? Adam. Adam, where are thou? Right? Where are you? What when God is asking a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Right? It's when sin came, our spirit was separated from the spirit of God. And so when God he, he comes into the garden and he's like, Adam, I can't find your spirit. Where are you? We are not, you are not in the same place where we met. And that is what sin did. That is the seriousness of sin is all this. It's we are separated. Right? Long story short, John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, important point to note here. Eternal life is not longevity of life or you know how long you exist after you die. Now, when we die physically, you are going to continue to exist in hell or in heaven. That's not what eternal life means. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what was separated, that our spirit man was separated from God, is reunited. And at that moment, we have eternal life. Understood? So why is all of this is important when we talk about the presence of God? Because from Genesis chapter 3, okay? From Genesis chapter 3, from this fall, all the way fast forward to Exodus chapter 25. Let's go to Exodus 25. So between Genesis chapter 3 and Exodus 25, there is a lot that happens, isn't it, in the Bible? Yes or no, guys? From Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus 25, what are some of the things that happen? Fall happens. Uh, Adam and Eve have uh, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. And then they have Seth as their other child. And then they have children. And then Noah comes into the picture. Flood happens. And then Abraham comes into the picture in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham, you know, uh, Rebecca, Isaac and Rebecca, all that episode is there. Um, Sarah and Isaac, Ishmael, that one scene is there. Jacob comes into the scene. Esau comes into the scene. Jacob becomes, uh, he tricks his brother. And then Joseph comes into the scene. Uh, Joseph is, uh, stole, you know, he's sold to slavery. A lot of things is happening, isn't it? From Genesis 3, and then we go to Exodus 1, then the story of Moses is being introduced. Okay? From Genesis 3 to Exodus 25. Okay, let's very quickly read uh, just verse 8. Okay. Exodus 25, verse 8. It says, then, is everybody there? Exodus 25, verse 8. Okay, cool. Then, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Verse 9. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern 
I will show you. Okay, verse 8 once again. Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. So the time, the gap between Genesis 3 and Exodus 25 is approximately 2,500 years. Okay? Why is this important? And why do we need to learn or understand all this? For 2,500 years, since the time of the fall in Genesis 3, there was no dwelling place for God on earth. Okay? There was no resting place. What was happening before the fall? God dwelt among Adam and Eve. Isn't it? Dwelling place. What's the word for it in Hindi? Dwell, dwelt. Uh, sorry? Le, yeah, in Le, okay, in, but in Hindi? So he, he was there among them, right? So before the fall, he lived among them. But from the time, Genesis 3 to Exodus 25, there would be times where God, it says, God visited. God would visit. His hand was on this person, right? His, he would visit. There will be visitations of God. But there was no resting place on earth for 2,500 years. It's almost like mankind did not feel it was important for God to dwell among them. And so in Exodus, what happens? Israelites are in Egypt for how many years? Four hundred and thirty. Thirty years with Joseph, but in, in slavery, four hundred years, right? Four hundred years. That is 10 generations. In you, 10 generations, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We have exactly 10 of y'all sitting here. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10. Whoa. Imagine you went into Egypt and your generation, and your generation. Generation after generation after generation after generation after generation after generation after generation. All you have known for 400 years, all you have seen for 400 years, are the idols of Egypt, the gods of Egypt. You are used to seeing how the Egyptians worship. You've never heard, you've heard of this God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? You've heard, but you haven't heard from him or seen him or experienced. That's a long time, isn't it, guys? Finally, in Exodus 25, verse 8, after the people, when it came to the 10th generation, God took them out of Egypt into the land of Israel. What's the first thing that they do is, we don't know who this God is. We haven't heard of him. We haven't seen him. All we are used to seeing is the gods of Egypt. And Moses is gone for 40 days. We can't find our leader. So the first thing they do is, they build, they go back to their old ways, what they know, what they've seen for 400 years. Let's make a God for ourselves. They build a golden calf. We all know that story, right? People sin and whatnot. And that is why, after all of these mistakes, after all of these sins and whatnot, God tells this same people that built the golden calf, the same people who gave their gold, their jewelry for this idol, make them give for my sanctuary. It says in Exodus 25, look at that in the beginning, Exodus 25, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Verse 3. 
These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and fine linen. Okay, we'll stop there. But the point is, God is making these people who gave for that idol to give to build the sanctuary. And so finally, after 2,500 years, there is a dwelling place on earth for God. He dwelt among them. He dwelt. He was there as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He was there. Are you with me? And so the tabernacle of Moses was a, like a bridge. Okay, we've all seen a bridge. It connects one side to another side. The tabernacle of Moses was like a bridge between heaven and earth, where divinity would meet with humanity for the first time in 2,500 years. Are you still with me? Yes? So, he dwelt among us simply means, in other words, the root meaning of it is he tabernacled among them. That's why it's called as the tabernacle. Okay? He dwelt among us, he tabernacled among us. Now, let's go to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Thank you very much. Right? He was with God in the beginning. Now let's come down all the way to verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh. Okay. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Okay? He dwelt among us. He tabernacle this is no longer the tabernacle of moses it's not a shadow word became flesh jesus dwelt among us right um another scripture let's go to psalm 132 How are you guys doing online or offline? Okay. Okay, Psalm 132. Verse 13. It says, For the Lord has chosen Zion. Okay? For the Lord has chosen Zion. Okay, let's do a quick stop before we continue. Look at me. Okay, a question. Um, how many of you here have desired for something? Even those online. Like if you, Say yes if you desired for something. Have you desired? Desired matlab? You understand? A little loudly, bro. Okay, you understand? Desire, right? Have you desired something? <laughs> yes? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to ask what is it. <laughs> uh, we've desired so many things, right? It could be a thing. It could be a dog, a pet. It um, could be a gadget, uh, whatnot. Right? But then you hear, see the next line, verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. 
verse 14. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. Isn't that beautiful? The first thing that we need to understand as about the presence of God is, it's not that how much we long for Him. We need to realize that He longs for us. He longs to dwell among us. That's why the Word became flesh. He came, isn't it? He desired, He came because He desired to dwell among us. Are you with me? Right. Another uh, uh, example, the popular example of the presence is the day of the Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Right? Acts chapter 2. It, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit came like a... Say it loudly. The Holy Spirit came like a rushing wind. Everybody say rushing wind. Everybody say rush. Say rush again. He came like a rushing wind. Now, when do you see a rush? A rush when the time is over. Okay, when someone wants something, like when you have like on like major sale or happening somewhere, everybody's rushing towards it, isn't it? You don't see it nowadays because everything is online. <laughs> yes. Rush our traffic, we say. Why? Because everybody has to get to work on time. Right? Everybody is in a rush. Someone will always be in a rush only when they want something urgently. And when we see that he came like a rushing wind, it again says that he wanted to be there more than they wanted him. Are you with me? Yes? So that's the beauty of the presence of God, is that we need to understand that He longs to be with us more than we long for Him. That is the truth. That's why He came. We didn't go. In the 2,500 years, the gap between Adam and Exodus 25, nobody seemed to ask Him a question, can I build you a dwelling place, a resting place? Until God says, have them make me a, a sanctuary. Are you with me? Yeah. So that is like oh, half an hour is gone, or just the introduction of for us to understand the importance of the presence of God. Are you with me? When Jesus says, "When two or three are gathered in my name, He is there." We we use that so many times. When we say we are gathered together in His name, gathered together, what is that? Gathering, right? Get together. In Jesus' name, that means that get together will look like, it should look like how it looked when Jesus was there in 2000 years ago, right? That means He is there. Um, so, and so that's the longing. Again, uh, He says, when two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. He is the initiator of everything in our lives, isn't it? He starts everything. He wants us more than we want Him. Yeah? And so um, that is the beauty of the, of the, of the presence of God. Um, let's, just, let's look at... Um, so the varying manifestations of the presence of God in, in, your, in your notes. Uh, so God is omnipresent. Uh, Nina said, uh, there's a presence of God, uh, what we believe by faith, that is, He is with us. And then there are times that He manifests. So presence of God, everybody say omnipresent. What does that mean? He is with us, sorry. He's present everywhere, right? The same God who is here, He's present here, He's present with those online, He's present in another country, in another part of the world. His presence is everywhere. Psalm 139, where can I run from your presence? 
right? If I run to the east, you are there. If I run to the west, you are there. If I make my beds in the depths of the ocean, you are there. There is no escaping from his presence, right? And then there is his manifest presence where he decides to show up, right? In John chapter 1, verse 14, word became flesh. We see that, right? Word became flesh. That is the manifest presence. Right? And in the Old Testament, you see time and time again, uh, you can actually go and Google it, uh, is time and time again, God will show up, manifest himself as a cloud. Right? Uh, you read um, in Exodus chapter 40, um, I'm not going to read now, but Exodus chapter 40 in First Chronicles, when Solomon builds his temple and all of that, it says, the cloud of God's glory filled the temple. And the priest could not stand. They would all fall down because of the weight of his glory. Right? Um, so that is the manifest presence of God. So there is omnipresent. And then there is the manifest presence, right? Uh, very quickly, let's look at our approach to God's presence. How do we approach this presence? Okay. First one, what we've been learning all through this semester is we approach this presence through praise, right? Uh, some in in the earlier classes we learned that praise is God's address, right? And that's where you want to find God where He is. Uh, you find a group of people who's praising him, he is there. Right? So we, we um so we approach his presence through praise. Um we I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with with praise, right? Um someone read Psalm 95 verse 2, please. Okay, let us come before his presence with let us come before his presence with thanksgiving okay uh, yesterday we did something beautiful at church uh, at north okay um see so here's the thing i don't want you to say it out loud you can write this out and i want you to take only 10 seconds write one thing that you are thankful for to God right now even you guys online the one thing that you are thankful for you can write a lot of things but for time's sake the first thing that comes to your mind I'm thankful for this 10 9 8 7 see that 6 Five, four, three, two, one. All right. I don't know how many of you have this habit of writing the sound out, but there's something called um uh you know what gratitude is? Like it's an expression of being thankful, gratitude. Okay. Um I would encourage you to have a book or a journal called the gratitude journal okay gratitude journal means where you can write uh, i'm grateful for this god i'm grateful for this i'm grateful for this person in my life i'm grateful that i have air in my lungs i have i'm grateful because i have a shirt and a pant i am I'm grateful because i have a shoe i'm grateful for this i'm grateful for that right it's a very it's a very beautiful uh, practice i would say of just building this heart of gratitude to God, right? And Psalm 91 says, I will say of the Lord, right? I will say, I will declare of the Lord that he is my refuge, he is my fortress, he is my strong tower, he is my mighty fortress, he is the one who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Some things, not some things, most of the things regarding God has to be said. So you write it and then you say it, right? You write it and then you say it. I will say of the Lord, 
Okay, and so that's what 95, Psalm 95 verse 2 is all about, is you approach his presence with thanksgiving. He's magnified. Right? How many of you would like uh, a person constantly complaining about you? Is it written? Is there? No. It's just nothing. Why are you like this? You know what I'm saying? If someone is just constantly like nagging, it's like, hey, what is this? Hey, what? Hey, my life is absolutely there. Like, you wouldn't want to, f f you won't feel like being in, in, in that person's uh, presence, in the presence of that person, isn't it? And something is very similar to, it's the same thing with God, as in you keep cribbing, saying like, oh, Lord, why is my life like this? Oh, Lord, you wake up, like, Lord, why is my life like this? Lord, why is this person in my life? Lord, why is that? What do you think God's going to do? It's like, oh, <laughs> it's like, Lord, you're awesome. It's like, say what, what now? Can you can say, say that again? <laughs> Oh, you're awesome, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you're beautiful. I'm thankful for, for your presence in my life. You know, and then suddenly you're having getting the attention of heaven. It's it's like gravity. It's when you start thanking, heaven starts coming towards you. There's no escaping. Right? And so that's one of the key ways to um, you know, uh, approaching God's presence is through praise. Uh, we've understood that quite a bit. And then through worship, right? Let's uh, read um, Psalm 96, verse 8, please. Can someone read Psalm 96, verse 8? Mm. Okay, so once again, uh, just for the benefit of everybody listening online, Psalm 96 verse 8, Ascribe to the Lord for the glory, due His name, bring an offering and come into His courts. Bring an offering. Everybody say, bring an offering. Right? Now, we, we spoke a little bit about the tabernacle of Moses. Okay, who knows something about the tabernacle of Moses? What can you tell me about the tabernacle of Moses? Three parts, okay. The, okay, so the Tabernacle of Moses, I wish I had a board, but it had three parts, isn't it? Uh, the outer courts, the inner courts, and the, the most holy place, right? Also known as the Holy of Holies, right? So the outer courts, inner courts, and the Holy of Holies. So outer courts had two uh, furnitures. What is that? The altar, altar of sacrifice, and then it had a laver that like wash basin, like you know, where the priests would wash their hands. Inside the basin was made with mirrors, whatnot. Okay. And from outer courts, you enter the holy place. To your as soon as you enter to your right, you'll find a table with bread, right? Shoe bread. And to your left, you'll find a golden lampstand. And then right in front, you'll have an altar of incense. And in front of altar of incense, there's a thick veil. Okay, a thick curtain, a thick veil, right? And so on the other side of the veil was the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, uh, we're not going to study about it in detail, but it's it's just awesome. And so that's where the priests used to minister unto the Lord, right? Now, just for the sake of time, priests, right, the Levitical priesthood, they never went empty-handed before the presence of God. I want to say that again. Priests, okay, who were ministering, who were serving in the tabernacle of Moses, they never went empty-handed. They always had an offering in their hand. Are you with me? And so that's what Psalm 96 verse 8 is saying. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering. And the new covenant, obviously, we are not having 
you know altar of sacrifice and burning you know barbecuing all that is not happening but, but hebrew says oh, this is our spiritual sacrifice the fruit of our lips right sacrifice of praise isn't it let's uh, once again uh, let's go to psalm 95 psalm 95 very quickly verse 6 and we'll conclude with this okay psalm 95 verse 6 yeah thank you so come let us bow down in worship let us kneel before the lord our maker okay now we learned a hebrew word for worship is what shaha you remember that yeah what does it mean prostrate face down right before god that's a posture of worship isn't it so we're learning about approaching god's presence one is through praise thanksgiving you praise him you thank him the other one is you worship so psalm 95 verse 2 says come let us bow down in worship okay so how do you bow down So you're gonna get up off your chairs so you bow down right you go down on your knees or you go right so what happens when you bow down your whole body is going down yes or no your face is also going down yes or no and so we learned that uh bowing down before someone's presence before the presence of god is an act of surrender yes or no so what are all the things that you're taking with you when you're going down What is the, what is everything? True, all that is right. But just physically speaking, when you're bowing down, your face is also going down, your head. What are all the things in your head? Eyes, nose, ears, mouth, yeah? What he's saying is, I'm bowing down, I'm surrendering what I hear, I'm surrendering what I speak. I'm surrendering what I see. Yes or no? So all of these basic senses, everything what I'm going to see, what I'm going to hear, what I'm going to speak, I surrender. That is why it is an act of worship when we bow down. Okay, So that's the second way of how we approach God's presence. First one, thanksgiving. Second one, praise. Okay, That is it for this first hour. We will take a break and I'll see you all in 10 minutes. Okay? See you guys.